So here's the question. Who was the first human who harnessed fire? He was most certainly the Steve Jobs of his day. There's no record that the fire was initially produced by poorly paid cavemen in China or that it was marketed as eye flame. But um, using fire to cook has done more than bring evolution to the point where we have Rachel Ray and Anthony Bourdain. It has led to a massive increase in free time, a wider, safer, and richer diet, bigger brains, and of course, bigger bellies, as it happens. Understanding this more thoroughly can open the door to improvements in calorie counting and, of course, the prevention of obesity. Our next speaker is the Ruth B. Moore Professor of Biological Anthropology at Harvard. Please welcome Richard Rangham. Well, now for something completely different. Uh, we've been looking at uh, a global and uh, very uh, far in the future uh, problems um, in a wonderful way. Um, what I'm going to do is to take a very different perspective, uh, thinking about our evolution and what it tells us about a very specific problem that faces us today in terms of how we understand our nutritional advice. So uh, I'll be thinking about why these people are happy. Uh, they are happy not just because they've, they've killed a bush pig, but also because they are cooking it. Now, the significance of cooking uh, is something that in all sorts of ways has not been appreciated, I think, until uh, relatively recently. And part of the problem is uh, represented by what Marion Nussel says here, a biochemist who was invited by her university to teach a course on human nutrition. So this is what she says. I just went to the bookstore and bought a whole bunch of nutritional textbooks. I had about eight of them, and I laid them out on a table and opened them all to the page that talked about human nutritional requirements, and they were all different. And for those of you who get a little bit confused about whether or not you should be eating such and such a breakfast cereal or how much fat you should put in your diet or whatever, the same, I think, applies today as when uh, Marian Nussel uh, wrote that and uh, has subsequently written a whole bunch of wonderful books. So I want to talk about the problem of calorie counting, which is totally unsolved in terms of uh, the information available to people today with respect to some of the factors affecting it. And this is an important problem, whether or not you are thinking about the people who are relatively short of calories or the people who have too many calories. Either way, uh, one would think that it would be an advantage to be able to know more about how many calories you get from your food. So my entry into thinking about this comes from thinking about human evolution. And uh, here you have a sort of canonical view of it, where on the right we have three species of Homo, and on the left we have an ape-like thing, an Australopithecus, basically pretty much like a chimpanzee standing upright with a slightly bigger set of teeth. And um, the question is, uh, what was responsible for this change? And the big change happened something like two million years ago. Uh, for those in the Leaky Foundation, this is all very familiar stuff, I know, but I just want to remind you that uh, that was the point at which we had uh, the evolution of a species pretty much like us in the sense that it could go down Main Street and go into the clothing store and get the right fitting clothes. So uh, there's not, not that much change between uh, when you have Homo erectus uh, represented here by the Turkana boy and Homo sapiens represented by the president of Harvard and, and Homo heidelbergensis represented by the president of Yale. <laughs> so the standard story is that uh, what we had setting this off was the acquisition of eating raw meat, whether by scavenging or by hunting. And there's lots to be said for that. I mean, raw food seems to be just uh, absolutely terrific. And there are, there are many reasons why you would think that raw food is just fine for us. I mean, we are animals. Animals eat their food raw, so we should eat our food raw too. Why not? And almost everything you eat, if you think about it, is edible raw. And probably almost everything you eat, uh, you have eaten raw uh, at, uh, at different times. Raw foodism is, is quite popular. Maybe there are some raw foodists in the audience. Uh, and um, so for all these reasons, it looks as though raw food is a pretty good thing. Um, but I'm going to be suggesting otherwise. But nevertheless, uh, think about this problem. Think about 
what the food label is going to tell you about the number of calories in this sausage. Now, that's 694 in a raw sausage. So what do you think uh, you buy a pack of sausages and uh, you look at the back, and I actually did. This is real data from a supermarket where I got the sausages. And, uh, and the answer is this. It says there's fewer calories in the cooked. So that's kind of rather peculiar uh, if you are thinking about the benefits of cooked food. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that conforms to the general way that people have understood the difference between the calorie gain you get from eating cooked food and the calorie gain from eating raw food. And what this comes back to is the way in which it's done. Here is a bomb calorimeter. The basic way in which people understand the number of calories in food is by blowing it up and seeing how much food, uh, how much heat is, is uh, released. So in a bomb calorimeter, you take some protein or carbohydrate or lipid or alcohol or whatever it is, and uh, you, you spark it and, and see uh, how much heat it releases, and you measure the, the uh, temperature rise in the water. Doing that sort of thing, then here you have the information available on the USDA standard website where it compiles all the data from all the labs uh, around the world, actually, but many of them uh, in the US. And here are some data showing when a particular lab has used exactly the same methods to look at a particular food raw and a particular food cooked. And the basic answer is there is no difference. So the sausage was, well, there's some dripping losses responsible for the cooked sausage having less calories than the raw sausage. But on average, there is no difference. That is what we understand from the information that is given to us today. So then we have the problem. Why is it that uh, people actually enjoy their food cooked on a very regular basis? I want to uh, suggest that it's not just because of the flavor and it's not just because of the safety factor. Uh, it's something else as well. Um, let's compare with chimpanzees. The chimpanzees that I study, like every other animal, eat their food raw, of course, and they produce babies. They produce babies just fine. What about human raw foodists? Human raw foodists, it turns out, have a problem. So if we look at the women, the men do have an equivalent kind of problem, but let's look at the women. What we see is that as they increase the amount of food raw up to 100%, then 50% uh, of the women, their ovulatory system has entirely shut down. And a significant extra proportion uh, are entirely subfecund. So the net result is that uh, these women are unable to have a baby. Now, the extraordinary thing about this is that they are not hunters and gatherers. These are people who are eating agricultural foods, agricultural foods that, from the point of view of providing energy, are far more effective than what you get in your typical hunter-gatherer diet because this is a fruit often said to be nature's perfect food. Not true at all. This is culture's perfect food. This is full of sugar, very low amount of fiber in it, indigestible fiber, a terrific provider of energy, only available to modern raw foodists, not to hunters and gatherers. Uh, they are using electrical processes to reduce the size of the particles and increase the digestibility. They are eating meat. Uh, I've shown data on infertility. We could look at data on thinness, and uh, the, those who were uh, thin uh, were the raw foodists, but eating meat made no difference to how thin they got. And then finally, they are eating from a global food resource. So they're never having any period when they can't get access to a decent meal, which is not true so much for the hunters and gatherers. So I think what this means is that we have to recognize that humans are different from every other species on Earth, that we are uniquely adapted to eating cooked food. And that raises a series of fascinating observations about what that effect has been on us. It also asks the question, what is the nature of the adaptation? And we still know very little about it. We know just some very crude things. Uh, we do, in fact, have smaller teeth. That seems like an adaptation to eating the softness of, of cooked food. Uh, we have relatively small guts. Uh, particularly, the large intestine is greatly reduced. So it means that we are unable to do what our cousin apes do, which is to get a lot of their energy from the short-chain fatty acids that are produced by fermentation in the colon. But the question I want to address is, uh, it's pretty clear 
from uh, the difference between human diets and their effects and the animal diets that cooking is in fact giving us energy, despite what the USDA tells us. And, uh, and what is going on? Well, the bomb calorimeter doesn't work. And guess why? It's because uh, in our bodies, food is not blown up. <laughs> Digestion is a relatively complicated problem. And I'm just going to uh, look at uh, two of the factors that are probably uh, among the more important. And one of them is bioavailability. There's not that many studies, even with starch, but there are a few studies of starch. It turns out that if you eat a potato raw and compare it with the effect of eating a potato cooked, then uh, when you eat the raw, something like half of the starch passes through the small intestine without being digested. If you eat it cooked, almost all of it, about 97%, is digested in the small intestine. So this has a big effect on the net amount of energy that you get out of the food. And uh, this factor of bioavailability, of the um, effectiveness uh, with which the digestive process is able to release molecules for digestion in the small intestine, looks like a major contributor. And uh, secondly, uh, there is the effect of the costs of digestion. The reason that you fall asleep after a heavy Thanksgiving meal may partly be because of the alcohol and partly because you're trying to avoid listening to your relatives, but it's also because uh, you have eaten a heavy meal and your body is doing a lot of work in the gut. And the amount of work that a gut does, there's all sorts of evidence, uh, it is increased if the food is eaten raw and it is reduced if the food is eaten cooked. What are the net effects of these? We still don't know. Here I've suggested that maybe the energy gain from eating cooked food compared to raw is 50%. It's a pretty wild guess at the moment, but I could attempt to justify those figures to you. Uh, and uh, that is based on the starch when it comes to meat or um, lipids from plants, both of which we know, uh, thanks to work by Rachel Carmody, who's in the audience, uh, lead to increased weight gain in experimental animals. We still have very little idea of the quantification of uh, the calorie gain. So what is the significance of this? Well, here is just one very particular significance. There are raw foodists who uh, want to bring up their children on raw food. They have a wonderful philosophy, which is sort of fantastically purist and, um, and, and intriguing in all sorts of ways. But I think that now we know that humans are adapted to cook food unlike other animals, uh, and we know the huge energetic differences between eating cooked and raw, then we should take very seriously the observations that children grow extremely small on raw food diets. There are a number of cases where children have died um, when brought up on raw food. It's difficult to be absolutely certain that it was because they were brought up on raw food, but the evidence looks so strong that I think there should be a law saying that it is, uh, it is uh, entirely inappropriate. It is quite wrong to uh, bring up your children on raw food. Uh, this was a, a, a blogger called uh, Taylor Wells who uh, very um, courageously and, and, uh, and, and sort of proudly almost recognized the fact that although she had been a raw foodist and was bringing her kids up on raw food, her kids were very small. Uh, she brought them onto cooked food and all of a sudden uh, they grew well and she has subsequently tried to persuade her raw foodist colleagues to be much more sane about this. Um, the bottom line here is that uh, the way in which we measure the consequences of cooking uh, are not adequate at the moment in terms of the information available to the general public. The essential problem is that it's all been done so far on the basis of biochemistry, on the basis of the composition in terms of proteins and uh, lipids and so on. And the biophysics of uh, food digestion have been paid very little attention. We know, in fact, that particle size affects how many calories you get out of the food, partly because of bioavailability, partly because of the cost of digestion. And the same is true for cooking. So uh, I think that in terms of solving both of these kinds of problems, it would be helpful to understand more about what turns out to be a really significant effect, even though we can't say exactly how much it is. But at the moment, the great claims made by this huge proportion of the book industry 
uh, about diets um, are uh, very often unfounded. There are some people who are interested in trying to uh, suggest that <clears throat> the physical constitution of the food has some kind of effect, but we need much more uh, information about this before we can have a sane understanding of the effects of cooking. Thank you. How popular is raw vegan right now? Do, you, do we have numbers of how many people are doing this? Uh, how popular is raw vegan? Uh, I don't have numbers. Um, I, I can say that uh, most major cities probably have some raw vegan restaurants. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they're vegan, sometimes they're not. Yeah. All right. It'll be interesting to see if you get that law passed. <laughs> <laughs>